right, I have several announcements. I think I announced this to you last time, but we have some people here who weren't here then. Have you done your student course evaluations? Yes. Is that all? Okay. Uh, the dean and others in the administration are really on to our cases because the participation in student course evaluation has been declining over time and may actually be less than 50% now. Some people I heard even lower numbers than that. But uh, we need to turn that around. Uh, Aria is here. Mostly because, well, number one, we want your feedback. That's the main thing. And we're not getting as much of it uh, with very few people turning it in. But what's more than, well, in addition to that, we have a uh, SACS visit coming up in a few years, and they're going to look at data from way back now up until then, and even before, but we need to get, uh, show that we do get good feedback from students. So please, please do the student course evaluation. Those who have done it, how long it takes? Five minutes. That's about what I usually hear. Uh, so it's not much time. Please do it. Doesn't cost you a thing. Please do the student course evaluation. I use them. I look at mine to see where I need to improve. I also evaluate all of the instructors under me, and it's a stack, pretty big, adjunct and full time. And I use the student course evaluations and their evaluations to the max. I mean, uh, use it big time in there. And then also, uh, you know, we just get uh, ways to make ourselves better. Nick is here. Uh, you'll also be asked to do maybe one or two other evaluations besides the course. Okay, that may be something like registration process, admissions, uh, library services, groundskeeping, whatever. Please do those too because sometimes they don't get the feedback I get every day when we meet, you know, so uh, so please do those evaluations as well. We really need those. They want us at more than 80%, not less than 50%. So please do the student course evaluation. And you see, we've already had one, two, three people withdraw from the class, several others. Well, either they didn't pay, uh, actually four people uh, that didn't pay and no longer came. They're going to count that as part of the base. I don't know why they do that. They never were officially in the class, and yet we've got to have 80% counting those people who never came. You know, so it's sort of crazy. So please, please do the student course evaluations. We need that data, those data. Now, second thing. Normally I have office hours today, uh, 3.15 to 5.15. I still do, but I've got a situation. I've done some evaluations of instructors on the Birmingham campus, left them with the secretary over there so she could get the signatures. I need to go add my signature to it, make copies, distribute the copies, and that kind of stuff. If they did that yesterday, then I need to go over there today before she leaves. So I'll be leaving here, not right at 3.15, but shortly after 3.15, to go take care of that business over there. And then once I'm there, I'll just spend the rest of my office hours over there. Because it's a half hour to get there, maybe not quite, but close. And a half hour to drive back. That's one hour of my office hours. I can't afford just to be driving. Uh, already going to lose a quarter of it. I don't need to lose a half. So I'll just be over there uh, the rest of the afternoon. If she got the signatures. Now, if they didn't come by to sign those with her, which I think they probably did, I'll be calling her at the beginning of the office hours just to see if she has them. If she does, then I'll be going over there. If she doesn't have them, I'll stay here and I'll be here with her. Now, number two. Friday, I usually have office hours on the Birmingham campus, 745 to 1145. Not this Friday. I have an infusion scheduled for this Friday, so I will be at the Kirkland Clinic before 7 o'clock and probably after 4 o'clock or somewhere around 4. Usually it's when they finish. So and then I'll be going home. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, I know I will not be on the Birmingham campus Friday. So, any uh, questions on anything we've done or about anything before we get started today? And I apologize for this. 
I was telling the students who were here earlier, yesterday morning, just about the middle of my class, I just started sneezing and running nose and stuff like that. Hadn't had any problem before. And every time I'd leave the classroom, it'd dry up. And when I come back in, it would get worse until yesterday afternoon. No problem at all. I had a class 315 to 7, well, I was in here 315 to 515, and not a big problem. And then this morning, it started again. I don't think I've blown my nose since 1215 yesterday, you know, when I left this classroom. And now it's all started, well, not, it's not nearly as bad as it was yesterday. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if there's something in the ventilation system or what. But it was on yesterday, then afternoon, and it did bother me. So I don't know. All right, any questions? All right. Now, we've done example one, okay? That was done last time. This is the slide after that. The first step in each of those examples that we did before is to express the radical of the given, the radicand, that's what's inside the radical, of the given radical as the product of two factors. One must be a perfect nth power. If it's a square root, it's a perfect square. Seventh root, perfect seventh power. Okay, you get the idea. Cube root, perfect cube. Okay? Other than one. Okay? Perfect nth power other than one. Also observe that the radicands, that's what's inside the radical, of the first radicals. In each case, the radicand cannot have a factor that is a perfect power other than one. Okay? So we say that these final radicals, like 2 root 2, 3 root 5, 2 cube root of 3, 3 cube root of 2, all those are in simplest radical form. If you had something else in there, I think you should have started out square root of 8. Not simplest radical form. Once you get out that square root of 4, which is 2, pull that on the outside, now you can't go any simpler than that simplest radical form. It's sort of like with fractions, once you got out common factors, that was simplest form. This is a uh, simplest radical form. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. And this, yeah, bottom of the page 253 if you're following in the book. You may vary the steps somewhat in changing to simplest radical form, but the final result should be the same. So there's lots of ways to get there. Here are some different approaches to changing square root of 72. Now, what would you do to get square root of 72? To simplify that. It's not a perfect square itself. Okay, I know you're on here. I just can't find you. Justin, right? Okay. Couldn't find your name. Okay. And? All right. I'm, uh, I'm here. Let's see. No, I mean, Jasmine's here. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I think he's going to break the curve first. So go to watch. Okay. All right. So, how would you deal to try to simplify? Is, is square root of 72 a simplified form? It may be. What you get? Yay or nay? What do we look for? So, square root, who do you look for? Perfect. Oh, Monday is one time. Squares that would be hiding in 72. Any of you see a perfect square that's in there? <clears throat> no. Nine, yes, for sure. This is square root of nine times the square root of eight. Okay? So the square root of nine is three. So three times the square root of eight. Your square root of eight in simple radical form. Any perfect squares hiding in eight? Four, yes. So eight is square root of four times square root of two. So the square root of four is two. And two times three is six. Six 
six times root two. Then it is. Okay? Now you got it the same way they did here. Use first of all that the square root of nine is in there. Pull that out, make that three. But then you look at the square root of eight and say, wait, there's a square root of four in there. Pull that out, made that a two. Left with the square root of two, three times two, three from nine and two from four. Uh, that became six, six times root two. Okay? Now, you may have said, rather than that, oh wait, I see a square root of four in there, and then a square root of 18, that became a two. A square root of uh, 18, though, two times the square root of nine, so that's square root of two times square root of nine, I mean two times the square root of nine, which is three times root two, and you got the same place. If you were really uh, observant and taught it right, you would say, wait a minute, 72 is exactly twice 36. And 36 is the perfect square root, remember? Now I'm pointing to the board over here. Remember what I did before? I wrote the numbers 0 to, didn't need 0 in there. It didn't really need 1, but 0 to 10, 1 to 10, and 2 to 11, 11 to 12, and then through the square, through the cube, through the fourth, through the fifth. That's a while until you get to the bigger numbers. But, recognize those perfect squares, perfect cubes, perfect fourth powers, maybe a few perfect fifth powers, and that's about all you'll usually need. Okay? But anyway, if you saw 36 is in there, square root of 36 is 6, and what you have left is square root of 2. So you can get there in one step there. Okay. Chris, right? Alright, anyone else come in just a call go? Alright. Another variation of the technique for changing radicals in the simplest form, and I showed you this last time, prime factor the radicand. Then look for perfect nth powers in the exponential form. And I think that's what they're going to do next. Yeah. Well, no, they're not. Okay? They just said that. They didn't give an illustration of it. Well, not, I'm not sure. Okay? Okay. They skipped example two. I was just trying to see where in the world is example two here. They skipped it. So let's go back and do example two. All right? This is not example one. It's example two. And we'll pick up and go from here. Express each of the following in simplest radical form. Well, let me get my pen changed. Okay. The square root of 50. Do you think that's in simplest radical form? No, why not? Okay, it contains a 25. So this is the same as the square root of 25 times what? The square root of 2. Okay, you leave it under the square root. What is square root of 25? 5 root 2. Is that in simplest radical form? Yes. No more perfect squares hiding in 2. Can't find any. Okay, how about this one? This already got a number out front. 3 times the square root of 80. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a Kanisha. Okay, now I see. Okay. First walked in, I always got those beside you. Okay. And here's JP. Okay. Keep them coming. Okay. What we're doing is simple radical form. We're not example one, this is example two, it's not on the slide set. Okay. How would you approach that? Actually, what they're doing here, they're doing the prime factorization. So since you can see that first when we didn't do it, let's do prime factorization of this one. Okay? The 3 is there. Don't lose it. Don't throw it away. 3. Now let's do a prime factorization of 80. What's the smallest prime number that will go into 80? 2, okay? 
That will certainly go into it. How many times will it go into it? 40. 40. What, is 40 a prime number? No. Okay. So what's the smallest prime number will go into 40? 2. And what's left? 20. Is 20 a prime number? No. No. What's the smallest prime number will go into 20? 2. two. Is what will be left? 10. What's the smallest prime number will go into 10? 2 times. Is that a prime number? Yes, it is. Look at that. Okay? Now, what's your index of this radical? Oh, Melvin decided to show today. What a surprise. Okay. Hey, good to see you. Huh? Okay. All right. What's the index of this radical? The index. Okay. Now, for for uh, coefficients and exponents, if you don't see a number there, you assume it's a one. For radicals, if you don't see a number, you assume it's a two because it's a square root. Anything bigger, like cube roots or six roots or eighteenth root, you got to put the little index in there. For square roots, you don't. You can if you wanted to, but you don't have to. Okay. and you already did. All right. So, what was my index? Two. So what we do is look for pairs of the same number. Do you see any? Yes. Here's a pair. There's a pair. I almost feel like we're playing poker, huh? No, not quite. Okay. All right. And that's it. We're on example two on page 254, uh, the B part. They didn't show it on the slide set, so we're doing it ourselves. So what you can do, since it's a square root of two squared, pull out a two. Another square root of two squared, pull out another two. So that gives us three times two times two times what's left? Root five. It stays in there. And 3 times 2 times 2 is 12 root 5. That is in simplest radical form. Okay? And look, the book got it right too. Good for them. Does that make sense? I just wanted to show you this. If, if you were doing it other ways, uh, you could have looked at this and said, Oh, I see there's a 4 in there, hiding in there, 4 times. Uh, 20, and then say, wow, there's another 4 in there. That's 4 times 5. So you pull them out just like you did here. Here's the prime factorization does really all the work for you. You don't really have to struggle with it too much. Okay? Now let's do one with a higher index, like the cube root of 108. This one, I'm thinking probably a good idea to go on and do a prime factorization. So that'll be a cube root of smallest prime number going to 108. 2. 2 times what? Say again? 54. Right? What's the smallest prime number going to 54? 2 times what? 27. Smallest prime number going to 27? 3. 3 times what? 9. Smallest prime number going to 9? 3. So therefore, and what's left? 3. And that is a prime number. Now, what's your index here? 3. That's pretty obvious there. Okay, it's right there. And now we look for triples. There's the triple. Okay? And that means we can pull out a 3. So that would be the cube root of 3 cubed is 3 times the square the cube root okay of what's left over 4 you can go back and multiply it back together okay see how that works okay now this would have been harder to do by factoring 
uh, because frankly, I don't see a 27 in there. It is, we see it is in there, but just glancing at it, I don't see a 27 there, okay? So therefore prime factorization will clear it up for us to be able to write that. Now I want you to notice something I almost did there, and I make this mistake way too often. Once I start doing, and pull out this, and then when I look at what's here, I'll do a screw report. No, you got to remember to carry that cube, uh, the, the index over. Sometimes I just forget to, and I know that's not the right answer. Okay. Any questions on that? And they got it to three times the cube root of four. Good deal. All right. So let's... That was example one. We already did that one. Goodness, that was long, wasn't it? Okay, ha, huh, here we are. No, we already did that one too. Here we go. Another property of the nth roots is ex ex demonstrated in the following examples. Okay, now what kind of root is this? Square root, okay? So what you can do is, and here's, here's the deal, folks. You can either take the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator. That would give you two. over, three. which is two. two. Or you could say, hey, look at that. 36 divided by 9 is? Four. Square root of 4 is? Two. two. So either way, you should get the right answer, okay? As long as you do all the steps right. Cube root of 24, uh, 64 over 8 was 60. Okay, do 64 divided by 8 is 8. Cube root of 8 is what? 2. two absolutely. Or you could have done the cube root of 64 over the cube root of 8, 4 over 2. That's also two. How about this one? Cube root of negative 8. Can you take the cube root of a negative number? No. Say again? You can. You can. You can do an odd root of a negative number. You can't do the even root. Square root, fourth roots, tenth roots, eighteenth roots. No, you can't have a negative number in there. <coughs> Fifth roots, seventh roots, ninth roots, third roots. Yeah, you can. So what is the cube root? Uh, well, if you do that division first or simplify that fraction, what do you get? One over eight, negative one eighth, and that would be the cube root of negative one, which is negative one, and the cube root of eight is two. So that negative one half. Or you can do numerator and denominator, cube root of negative eight is negative two, cube root of sixty-four is four, and negative two over four is negative one half. Make sense? Alright. Sorry. Uh, Jay, right? Alright. Sorry about my Drainage, it just comes in the morning in this room, nowhere else. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on? We just finished the uh, illustration, middle of page 254. We're getting ready for this property, 5.5. In general, we can state this property that the nth root of b over c is also the nth root of b divided by the nth root of c. And Tyrus here. Attendance today. Okay. Now, that's true only when the nth root of b is a real number and the nth root of c is a real number. Okay. Now, this is a little bizarre, but it could happen. If that b were negative and the c were negative, and that was an even index. Okay, you can't do this because you can't take even index of a negative number. But if you did the division first, that becomes a positive number. Then you can can take the index of that. So that's why they say when these are real numbers. And of course C is not equal to zero. We don't want that down there. Property five point five states that when the that the nth root of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the nth root. And that is true <coughs> as long as those are defined. If they're not defined, you may have to divide before you try to do that and get rid of the minus sign. 
Okay. So, if we're going to do that, what's to be the square root of 426? You want to do it right off the top of your head? You can't, then take it down. Square root of 4, 2 over square root of 5, 2 fifths. How about cube root of 27 eighths? See, you can't divide this, okay? You can't simplify that. So this would be cube root of 27, 3 over 2. Perfect. Excellent. Okay? So evaluate radicals such as that for which the numerator and denominator of the fractional radicand are perfect nth powers, then use that property 5.5. Or rely, rely on the definition of the nth group. Okay? So we just did this one. Uh, or this is what they mean. You know that's the nth root because 2 fifths times 2 fifths is 427. So you don't have to do it this way if you see that's already a perfect nth root of a fraction. I'd find it easier to do it this way. And so it's right here. Yes, I would have seen that could be that, but this is to me a little easier to do. Okay. Now. We're approaching a problem. Okay, radicals such as the square root of 28 over 9 and the cube root of 24 over 27, in which only the denominators are perfect f powers, they can be simplified. We'll just continue and do it. What would be, how would you approach that? Certainly 9 won't go into 28. So don't try to divide. So what would you do first? The square root of 28 over the square root of 9. Well, what is the square root of 9? 3. So that's going to be 3. How about the square root of 28? Say again? Okay, it's 2 times 14, but neither of those are perfect squares. You see it? Say again? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Uh, 4 times 7? Is that what you said? Oh, it won't stay 28 because it has a perfect square hiding in it. I just gave it away there. Huh? Four times seven. Okay. Well, they didn't do it. They left it square root of 28. Okay. But now you look at that and say, whoa, there's a perfect square hiding in there. Square root of four times square root of seven. What's square root of four? Two. Two. So it'll be two root seven over three. That's the simplest radical. This is not, you can still simplify. So simplify as long as you can. It's like factoring. When you factor, then you always look at the same, and I factor this in even more. And you just keep going. Okay, let's do this one. Cube root of 24 over 27. Can you think of anything to do with that? Three. Say again? Three. Okay, you're going to factor out of three. That's going to get you in the problem. So it might have to be okay. Okay, so if you factor out a 3, that doesn't really help you a lot because 3 is not a perfect cube. What about 8? Okay, 8, there is a perfect cube in that, so let's factor that out. You don't write it here. Cube root of 8 times the cube root of 3. And then how about that denominator there? 3. Yeah, that's the cube root of 3. So you jumped right over, you did this step and that step at the same time, which is perfectly fine. What they wanted you to do was first break it into cube root of four, the numerator of the cube root of the denominator. The root of the radical of a fraction is the fraction of the radical. Okay? And then you break, well, they left that alone. They saw this is a perfect cube of, 20, of 3, so they carried that 3 throughout. They stopped and looked at this, like you said, right at the top, it has a perfect cube of 8 in it, and that's 2. And you're left with a perfect cube, uh, with a cube root of three, which is not a perfect cube. So you have a cube root of eight is two, so it's two thirds root of the cube root of three. And again, watch out for those little indices. I tend to forget to put them in there, and I give the answer. I've done the process right, but give the answer wrong because I left it as a square root rather than a cube root. So be careful on that. Okay. Now, 
let's take the idea of simple radical form just a little bit further. It's partly a summary, but it's also a little bit nothing new here. Let's summarize some ideas that pertain to simplifying of radicals. A radical to, is said to be in simplest radical form if, remember the first one we did? No. Okay. Yeah. They did it in different order. Here's the new thing. No fraction appears in the radical sign. Okay? Now, what I like to say, no denominators in the radical. Okay? That works just as well. Number two, no radical sign appears in the denominator. Okay, in other words, no denominators in the radical, but also no radicals in the denominator. Okay, we're going to talk about how to get rid of them, but these are the rules. And this is the one we already did. No radicand, when expressed in prime factored form, contains a factor raised to a power equal to or greater than the index. Okay, that's a strange way to say. Uh, this is so hard to read, isn't it? Uh, if you did a prime factorization of whatever number that was, that takes up a square root of 40, first you see a prime that, that would be 2 times 2 times 2 times 5. Well, that's the square root. Pull out a pair of that, that's a 4, uh, a square root of 4 is 2, and you're left with 2 times 5, so that would be square root of 10. That would be a radical form. Those are the things we've already done. These are the two new ones. No denominators in a radical, no radicals in a denominator. Okay. Now, how do we keep those first two from happening? All right. And that's what we call rationalizing the denominators to simplify radicals. Okay. Let's go back for a minute. Why can't we do this? They're real numbers. Square root of two is a real number. Square root of three is a real number. Why is it they don't want us to have a radical in the denominator? You folks have grown up with calculators. You can plug that in a calculator and give you the right answer. If you plug it in that, right? But guess what? In the old days, okay. And this wasn't that long ago, folks. I saw my first calculator my sophomore year of college. Okay? It was, uh, I was in a, I may have told you this already, in a physics classroom, 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, big lecture room, held probably 200 students. Yeah, I was going to be cool if you sat in those big classrooms of physics students. Because everybody takes them. And uh, in walked these two guys with these calculators strapped to the belt. That's how they used to wear them. Okay? Now, these big old bulky things, nothing like the little calculators y'all have. Big old bulky thing. You had to plug it in. You could, it didn't have a solar strip or anything like that. You had to plug it in to, to use it. Didn't even have a battery. Later, they had batteries that would run out. And you, hours, but this didn't even have that, okay? And you could add on that, you could subtract on that, you could multiply on that, and you could divide on that. And it cost you about $400. Too rich for my blood, okay? But those were the first calculators I remember seeing, okay? In just a few years' time, they got to do a lot more things than add, subtract, multiply, divide. And the price came down dramatically. Okay? It took a while. Okay? But the rest of us sitting back in the room, the other 90, 198 of us looked at that and said, There goes the curve. Okay? Because they knew those guys could just punch in their answers, you know, the numbers and get the answers really quickly. We had to use a slide rule. You don't even know what a slide rule is, do you? That's how you estimated uh, answers for big, big numbers. Okay? Or hard multiplication. Uh, because in physics we had those. Sorry, folks. And guess what? I didn't always do it, but a lot of people wore those straps to their belt, too, okay? Uh, that's how they wore the calculators. Maybe that's why they wore the computers that way, too. But, I mean, the slide rule. Okay. Y'all are used to things that can do this easily. 
But before then, before my sophomore year in college, or a little bit before that even, how you did something like that, the square root of 2 over the square root of 3, if you tried to do it that way, if someone's got a calculator, punch in the square root of 2. 1.414, somebody give me the rest of the digits. Anyone got a calculator? Square root of 2. 1.414 what? Give me some numbers, folks. Square root of 2. Is that all you got? Okay. That's divided by square root of 3. Seven. Eight zero eight. Is that right? All right. Now, number one, they wouldn't have had a calculator to go to to do that. They'd have gone to a table of square roots, big old table somewhere, to pull out as many digits as they had. They probably wouldn't have that many digits, but they would. Now, how do you do that division? Then you would bring down the house and put the 1.414213. Five, six down here, and then you would move your decimal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. This is how they used to do it, folks, and then you'd start long division. Didn't have calculators, didn't have computers. This is how you did long division. That looks like a really interesting problem to do, doesn't it? Uh, that would be a zero here, okay? And then you start doing that, and soon you build up one piece of paper trying to do that division and getting it to a few digits of accurate precision. That's how you had to do it. There weren't any calculators, okay? Now, I want you to imagine this. Does anyone heard of a project called the Manhattan Project. Anyone ever heard of that? It was before your time, I admit that. I thought maybe in history you had heard of it. Yes, that's the U.S. Uh, secret, very top secret thing they did to develop the atomic bomb. Exactly. Because they were afraid the Germans were really close to getting it. This is World War II time frame. They said, we've got to get it before they do or else we're done for. They start dropping those things on us, we surrender. And they take over, okay? So, we started this process. They had never split an atom. They had never gotten into this. It was all in theory, okay? And the calculations were astronomically complex, okay? And they didn't have calculators, they didn't have computers. How did they do these calculations? by hand, on paper. How did they do that? They brought in, they didn't tell them what they were working on, but they brought in the very best mathematicians and physicists and chemists and other scientists they could get, brought them into big rooms like this, maybe put 30 in this room, 30 in that room, 30 in that room, gave them a problem and said, do it. Figure out what square root of 2 and the square root of 3 is, okay? And they all did it, and they collected all the answers, and the one that showed up the most, they said, we hope that's the right one. Because it's so easy to make so many places to make a silly mistake and get a wrong answer. That's how they did this. They had the best minds they could get working on math problems because they did not have a calculator or computer to go to. And that's how they did it. Have any of you seen hidden figures? Okay, wasn't that an incredible movie? And that is very close to reality. They had room full of, and what did they call those people in the room? They generally were ladies. Computers! They were computing these numbers. 
Uh, it wasn't for the Manhattan Project. That was for sending someone to the moon. That was for getting someone into space. But that was still before computers, okay? But remember, the last part of that, they were beginning to install computers. And the other lady, I can't remember her name, but she, she said, if we learn the language, we got a job. If we don't, we're not going to be at work anymore. And that's what she did. She, she learned the, the language. That was ridiculous to do it that way. Okay? So here's what they did. That's way, and you see, have I told you before what a good mathematician is? A little bit lazy. They said, that is way too much work. Can you imagine doing that division? Let me show you the other way. What if we multiply numerator and denominator here by the square root of 3. That's legal to do, isn't it? Because square root of 3 over square root of 3 is what? What? And when can you multiply by 1? Anytime you want to, it doesn't change the value. But what does that do to your denominator? That makes it the square root of 9, which is 3. It makes it a whole number. 3. A rational number. 3. So your denominator becomes 3. Your numerator becomes the square root of 6. Okay? Now I'm going to pretend you're my table. So I'm going to touch on a calculator what the square root of 6 is. Okay? Divided by 3. And guess what, team? I think I can almost do that in my head. That would be 0 0.3 will go into 24, 8 times. 3 will go into 4, 1, carry 1. 3 will go into 19, 6 times, carry 1. 3 will go into 14, 3 times, carry uh, 2. 3 will go into 28, 9 times, carry 1. 3 will go into 19, 6 times, carry 1. 3 will go into 17, 5 times, carry 2. Three will go into that eight times, and three will go into three one time. Okay? Now, someone want to punch in on the calculator what the square root of two divided by square root of three is? Three point Have you got it? No. We'll do it. See, it takes too long to punch it in. You can almost do that in your head faster. Okay? That's it? That's it? Yeah, but it's 0, 9, it's zero, nine. It's what? It's 0, 9, it's 0, 9. Oh, 0, 9, I've got something. No, it's 8, 0, 9. Oh, 8, 0, 9. Okay, I only have that many digits. Okay. I'd say that's close enough for government work, right? Okay. So, see what rationalizes the denominator? If you had tried to do this division, I can't do that in my head. That would then, like I said, take up a page of paper to do that one division. When you rationalize the denominator, you might almost be able to do it in your head. But if you did it out here, it's still so easy. Because rather than having 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 digits to do, you have one digit. That's so much easier. So, we got into the practice of rationalizing denominators. That makes the division easier. But that was all before calculators when you needed it to be easy. Now it really doesn't matter. But guess what? This is math. This is academia. We do it the, the old way. Okay. No, we don't do it the old way, but we still carry those traditions. Okay. So anyway, that's what we got. Square root of 6 over 3. Okay? And that's how they left it. And that's fine. But I was showing you, you could get actually what the decimal number is pretty easily. So let's see if they do... Whoa! Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Alright. So that's what we've been talking about, rationalizing a denominator. Why do we call it rationalizing? What was the square root of 2? Or three, square root of 3. An irrational number. We don't want irrational numbers in our denominator. Remember, those are numbers that don't repeat any patterns or anything else. And CJ's here. 
All right. Uh, so that's what. So what we did when we multiplied by root three, we got a rational three. That's a rational number. We rationalized our denominator. We went from an irrational number to a rational number. That's what we call a rationalized denominator. We use that to simplify radicals. Okay. Now let's consider an example in which neither the numerator nor the denominator of the radicand is a perfect nth power. Guess what? Most of the time you're not going to have those perfect little numbers that come out so easily. You'll have things like this. Oh, we just did it, didn't we? Sup by the square root of 3, 2 thirds. What would be your first step? Okay, time out. What's wrong with this? You have a denominator in your radical. It's not in simplest radical form. Okay? So what would be your first step? Write that as, rather than the radical of a quotient, do the quotient of the radicals. What would that be? Square root of 2 over square root of 3. Okay? Now, we, we just did it, so you know what to do next. Why? What? You don't like, okay. So this broke the one rule. No denominators in the radicals. This breaks the other rule. No radicals in the denominator. But once you get this, you can get rid of the radical. How? Just did it. Yes, multiply by the square root of 3. But if you multiply the denominator by the square root of 3, what must you do? Multiply the numerator by the square root of 3 as well. And now that gives you in the numerator the square root of 6. In the denominator, what does that give you? 3. You have now written in the simplest radical form. There's no perfect squares hiding under a radical anywhere. And there's no denominators in a radical and no radicals in the denominator. You have a rational number in the denominator that simplest form. Okay? And we see why it's simplest, because if you're really having to do that by hand, that's a lot easier to do than either one of the other two. Y'all don't even know how to take a square root, and I would be hard-pressed to try to do that with a fraction anyway. But we used to have to do that, too. I can remember in high school or junior high, we, they had, we had to learn how to take a square root by hand because there weren't any calculators. <laughs> Y'all heard it. We walked a mile to school both ways and uphill, going home and coming to school both ways. Never mind, never mind. Okay. So that was example three. Let's see how they did it. They first broke it into the radical of a quotient is the quotient of the radicals. And then they multiply the denominator by uh, itself. And that's another form of one because you multiply the numerator by that same amount. And that gave you a perfect rational number, three in the denominator. And it made the numerator a little more complicated, but guess what? Not too bad. Square root of six over three. Oh, by the way, can that be simplified any further? How? Okay. You can't do this into a radical. If this had a 3 or 6 on the outside of the radical, yes, you could. But you can't go something not in a radical into something that is a radical. You can't do it. And vice versa. You know. So no, that is simple. That simplifies as far as you can. It's kind of like you know, how people used to try to factor things that should be factored. Say that again? No, it's okay. When you say simplify, were you meaning 3 into 6? No. no, you can't do that. Okay. You could take it back and say square root of 2 times square root of 3, but, yeah. but that's not simple. I mean, oh. you, yeah. If it had a perfect square in it, yeah, pull it out. But this doesn't have a perfect square. It has a 2 and a 3. Neither one of those is perfect square. So it's actually simple to write like that. Okay. Good question. Excellent question. All right. Now, we refer to this process we use to simplify the radical in example 3 as rationalizing the denominator. 
Note the denominator becomes a rational number. That's why we say it's right. Started off square root of 3, which was an irrational number. When you multiplied it by itself, it became 3, which was a rational number. Far easier to deal with. Now, they're skipping example 4. So let's simplify this. The square root of 5 over the square root of 8. Okay. Sorry. I think it's going to start again. I don't know why. <laughs> what is it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I guess it may be. It shouldn't be cold there, but I don't know. It, it happened yesterday morning, and I could... This time, that was only one sneeze. Yesterday, those folks, what's going on here? I just could not stop sneezing. It may get that bad now. What would we do to simplify that? Square root of 5 or square root of 8? Any ideas? Say that again. Okay. Uh, okay. The, the numerator is in simple practical form. You can't do anything to simplify it. Now, we may do something to mess it up, but we can't do anything to simplify it. Okay? Where is the problem child here? Yeah, that's in the denominator. Now, what's problematic about the 8, the square root of 8? There's actually two things. Did someone say something about a 4? Yes, that's the square root of 2 times the square root of 4. So let's rewrite this. Leave the square root of 5 the square root of 5. But rewrite the denominator the square root of 2 times the square root of 4. Is that right? What is the square root of 4? 2. So this would be square root of 5 over 2 times the square root of 2. I like to put the whole number in front in the radical after. Now, What's wrong with this picture? Anything? We took care of having a hidden perfect square inside a radical. We got that out. But what's wrong with this one? You still have a radical in the denominator. Right? That's one of the rules they don't want you to have. How do we clear that? Last example. Multiply by... the square root of 2. But if you multiply the denominator by the square root of 2, what must you do? Numerator by the square root of 2 as well. Okay. Now, what does this become? Numerator becomes square root of 10. Okay. No reason to keep them separate. They can't do anything. So, what does the denominator become? Not square root of 4. It becomes 4. 2 times... Oh, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, I got it. Okay, I know what you said. I, I realize what you said. My hearing's bad, but then once I started to... Okay. I think what I heard you starting to say was this. You had 2 times the square root of 4. Four okay. So that's root 10 over... What's... It's what? 2 times 2. Yeah, that would be 2 times 2 because root 4 is 2, right? And that would be root 10 over 4. Perfect. Take as many steps as it needs for you to see what's going on here. I was jumping right to something else. She was doing it a different way. Her way is really good. Do it that way. If you see it best, do it however you see best. Can that be simplified any further? The only radical you have in the numerator, that's no problem there, and that radical doesn't contain any perfect square. So that's in simplest radical form. Okay? That was the first part of that. They showed three different ways to get there. Okay? The way I just showed you was solution C for them. Okay? Solution A for them 
let's forget about the 8 and do the square root of 5 over the square root of 8 times the square root of 8 over the square root of 8. And this gives you the square root of 40 over 8. The square root of 40 contains a perfect square. That's why I don't like doing it this way. That would be the square root of 4 times the square root of 10, and that's over 8. Well, square root of 4 is what? 2 root 10 over 8, but then 2 will go into 8. So you can divide out whole numbers. You can't divide whole numbers into radicals and that kind of stuff. So this will give you 1 over 4. So that gives you the square root of 10 over 4. So there's several ways to get there. Now, if you're really clever about it, there's solution B, I think they call it. They said, why don't we just multiply this by the square root of 2, because 8 times 2 is 16, that's a perfect square. So you could have gone back loud. All those ways get you to nirvana, get there any way you want to. All right, any questions on that? All right. Now, they're skipping example 5, too. Goodness gracious, they're skipping all the good ones, aren't they? Okay, so let's clear the ink here and do example 5. There are actually four pieces here. I don't know if we'll get them all done, but let's start with the first one. A is 3 root 2 over 5 root 3. Okay. Is anything wrong with that picture? Is that in simplest radical form? No. Why not? You have a radical in the denominator. Can't have denominators and radicals. Radicals and denominators are perfect squares or perfect nth roots or nth powers hiding inside nth roots. We don't have any of those, but we do have a radical in the denominator. How do we get rid of it? Multiply the denominator by the square root of 3. But if you do that, what must you also do? The numerator by the square root of 3. Okay? Now, what does the numerator become? 3 root 6. Perfect. The denominator becomes 5 root 9. Okay, what's root 9? 5 times 3, and that would give you... Okay, but hold here. Notice you could divide out the 3. So that gives you root 6 over 5. Or you could do it as 3 root 6 over 15, and then notice that you can divide here and get 5. Root 6 over 5. Okay? And that's what they got just for them. All right? Let's see if we can get another one that went so well. How about this one? 3 root 7 over 2 root 18. Anything wrong with that picture? <clears throat> so sorry. Yeah, you got a radical in the denominator. Okay? So we need to clear it. How could we do that? By what? Okay. That's certainly a possibility. Multiplying by the square root of 18. But guess what I am? Lazy. That's going to give me too much work. I don't like to multiply such big numbers. So I look at this and say, what's the smallest perfect square I can get out of this? Sure, 18 times 18 will be square root of 18 times square root of 18 will be 18. But can I multiply by some radical here that will give me a perfect square? Well, it's 2 times 18. Say again? 36. Is that a perfect square? Yes, it is. So I'm going to be lazier than you. I'm going to multiply this one by the square root of 2. That's what they did in their solution B before. So this, you have to multiply the numerator by the square root of 2. Okay, what does that give you in the numerator? 
3 times the square root of 14. Is that what I heard? Okay, and the denominator? Two times what? Square root of thirty-six. And what's the square root of thirty-six? And that'll be two times what? Six. Anything else we can do to simplify? What? Three will go into six. How many times? Two. So now we've got the square root of fourteen. No perfect squares in that over. See how that works? Yay, nay. Okay, good deal. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze another one in here. Number C. Ooh, the cube root of 5 over 9. Okay, is that a simplest form for a radical? Why not? You have a denominator in the radical, yeah, okay? And your first step is to move it to the radical in the denominator. What would you do first? The cube root of 5 over the cube root of 9. Now you have the radical in the denominator, which also you don't want. So what must we do? Simplify. How do we do that? Okay, now, here the square root of 9 will not work. I mean, yeah, because these are cube roots. So what, here's what you do. And again, it's sort of what we were doing before up here. Almost mentally, okay, do your prime factorization here. This is a cube root. So 9 is what? 3 times 3. Well, you can't take the cube root of two factors, but you could if you had two factors. To multiply this by the cube root of 3. Right? So 3 times 9 is 27. That is a perfect cube, right? You see? It's being lazy. Trying to do it as simplest way possible. Multiply this by the cube root of 3, but then you have to have to multiply the numerator by the cube root of 3. What do you get in the numerator now? the cube root of 15, and in the denominator, <coughs> the cube root of 27, which is, say again, 3. You've got it. There you have it. Can you simplify that anymore? No, you can't. If there's a number outside there, you could, not inside. All right, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Move his. Just when we we're beginning to have, oh, we we're always having fun. So we'll start next time with the D part. Didn't quite get all that done. But let me give you a few homework exercises. You want something to do this weekend, right? You can do any of the odds 1 through 19, any of the odds 21, whoa, look at that, 21 through 73. Try as many of those as you can. We'll uh, do the applications later. Good deal, folks. Have a good weekend. How about working on those research papers? This is the last weekend you have of the term because the weekend after that is finals, and you got to have it in before the last day of class. Okay? Get those research papers in to me, please. Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to see tissue. Oh, thank you so much. I was going to go down and get it, but thank you. Okay, which one? Either one or both or what? Uh, some, what you said? You, you said you didn't finish one of the tests. Yes, uh, the last one. The last one. Okay, let me uh, close this out so we won't.